We are live. Look at that. Welcome to the Techstars Advanced Manufacturing Summit. My name is Lila Partridge. I am the organizer and your MC for the day. And I will begin the panel in a moment, but I want to do a few logistics. And I want to start by first of all welcoming all the companies from the global manufacturing companies and the startups. We have about 70 startups on the website with their web pages. So go visit them. That's part of what we're trying to do here is network. And by the way, I'm telling all panelists to shamelessly promote your companies. So I expect you to talk about the companies you've seen you like. And for those in the audience, this is what we're all about. We're gonna help you connect with the cool startups we see globally. I also encourage you to visit the website after the event, because we're gonna have all of the um, recordings of everything you hear today in panels, and we're gonna continue the networking. So this is intended to go on beyond what we're just doing today. So keep, keep coming back. Um, and lastly, I would encourage anyone who's interested in doing Q&A, we don't really have time in this particular session to do Q&A. So we're, we have roundtables set up, particularly for those from the global manufacturing companies. Please join us and we'd love to answer questions there. So done with logistics, all good. I'm gonna turn it over and have folks introduce themselves. So let's start with, um, who are we introducing first? Oh yeah, Brett, you're up, go for it. Thank you. Uh, I'm Brett Brohl. I'm the managing director of the Techstars Farm to Fork Accelerator. We focus on food technology across the entire food system from on-farm to supply chain manufacturing logistics all the way through to um, retail tech and restaurant tech. And so um, I was an entrepreneur for a long time, built, uh, built a few companies, both venture back and bootstrapped, and um, love the food tech space. And uh, manufacturing is a huge part of food, and it plays a huge role in, um, in the food system. So excited to be here. Excellent. Taylor, you're up. Hello, everyone. My name is Taylor McLemore. I'm the Managing Director of the Techstars Workforce Development Accelerator. Uh, we really believe in investing in companies and supporting founders that enable human potential through work. That allows us to look at areas such as ed tech to uh, companies connecting supply and demand in the labor market and the future of work. Uh, future of work. And we also have a, um, a few areas that we've um, spent time with founders on in the manufacturing space, because I think there's a lot of great stuff happening there. So excited to be part of this discussion. Great. Martin. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, Lila. just realizing I'm the, the only European one. Uh, so thank you very much for, for having me. I'm the only one. We're good. All good. All good. <laughs> yeah, my name is Martin Olczyk. I'm the managing director for the Techstars uh, Smart Mobility Accelerator in Turin in Italy. And we are investing in everything movable from data, good services. And before joining Techstars, I was an entrepreneur myself. I created four companies, including one exit. And prior to that, spent a few years in mergers and acquisitions, three out of those in automotive and engineering m &A. Thank you. Scott. Thanks, Lila. Appreciate you having me. Today. My name is Scott Craigie. I'm the managing director for the Heritage Group Accelerator powered by Techstars. Heritage Group is, is an interesting one. It's unique in that our areas of focus are green chemistry, material science, infrastructure, asphalt. I'm always hunting for the, the next the next gen, the next innovation in asphalt. Uh, and Heritage Group is a fascinating company based here in the Midwest that has 41 different operating companies. Uh, before taking on this role uh, for Techstars, I, I, I've also been an entrepreneur. Uh, for about the last 20 years, uh, focused in platforms, focused in building enterprise-backed platforms um, to help companies move more efficiently in all spaces, specifically telecommunications. This is a new space for me. This has been a 14-month a, a exercise in my brain, and I'm learning all about electrochemistry and material sciences, which has been totally fascinating. So I'm excited to learn all from, from all of you as well. Wonderful. Um, my background is that I currently run the Techstars Accelerator with Stanley Black & Decker, so the Stanley Techstars Accelerator. We focus on AI, advanced manufacturing, and really look at discrete manufacturing. So you'll hear a lot of different manufacturing amongst all of us. My background, again, I was an entrepreneur for many years, and I was like way back in the dark ages. I was part of Intel Capital during the formative years, so I've been at this for a while. So with that, Brett, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about uh, food tech and what you're seeing in manufacturing there. Yeah, um, I kind of want to talk about asphalt um, uh, and, yeah, yeah. No, and you know, additions in asphalt. I, I got some ideas I could pitch you, Scott, around how to make asphalt better. It's a big deal up here in Minnesota where it's really cold and like it just gets in really, construction every year. Really cold, gets really hot. You guys have a lot of salt. So those are, that's not the right combination for asphalt. No. Um, so I'm glad somebody's working on that because um, I, I don't think I can do it. 
Yeah, the, I mean, the food space is really interesting. And, um, and the last year has uh, shown a light on the importance of manufacturing and food, um, you know, as, as people have seen different shortages in food products um, that have come through largely because factories being shut down, production facilities being shut down because of employee safety uh, for a variety of um, other reasons. And so that's, you know, there's been a bit of a highlight in, in what has historically been a very unsexy space, a space that's never really been talked about. Um, when you, when you think about food, people always tend to think about like on farm or grocery store. They don't think about what I call the messy middle. Um, and it's a part of, it's a part of the process and a part of the supply chain that is, uh, as important as growing it in many ways, uh, or, you know, at the end retailer, how does it get to, um, how does it get to the person that actually eats the food? And so it, it's an area that we've invested actually, um, a significant amount in, and, and as far as manufacturing and trends go in it, you know, huge trend, um, across the entire food system in robotics and the growth of robotics for a variety, and for, that's for a variety of reasons. And, and I would expect that our class this year will have multiple robotics startups in it that uh, we've had, we've invested in multiple already up to this point. And um, one part is that food manufacturing, in food manufacturing, it's a very, it's complex manufacturing in many cases. Um, it's very specific, high dex, uh, requiring high levels of dexterity, um, positions where it's been historically really difficult um, to automate. Um, and so when you think about food manufacturing, a part of that is uh, protein production, right? And so you are literally manufacturing animals in some ways, right? Where you're taking them apart um, and, and, um, in the United States and a lot of um, countries that are that have really advanced systems, they're actually quite good at it. And there's very little food waste. Um, you know, if you go to a, a food manufacturing facility, every single piece of every single thing that comes into that facility and goes out um, is is actually really efficient. However, it's also very largely done by human beings um, and very very manual. And when um, a there's and there's two problems with that. One. Uh, it, when something like COVID hits, right, you have um, you have to shut them down, and you can no longer produce things. Um, and so, I think the most recent shortage that was like in the news was a grape nut shortage, the the great grape nut shortage of which is a cereal brand, right, that happened recently. But you saw shortages of different proteins and prices going up significantly because you couldn't produce enough proteins. Um, that's one problem. The other problem is there's just not enough human beings to fill those roles, and that is a, a shortage that's going to continue to to happen. And so. Um, we're super interested in um, companies that are um, developing ways to do really complex tasks, not just like the stamp move, stamp move. It's very complex tasks um, as things move down a conveyor, in line, in existing systems, in, in facilities. And so that, that's one part of, um, that's one challenge that hasn't been solved in scale, at scale, um, for large food manufacturing at this point right now. Um, and something that, they're, that I believe that big food manufacturers are incredibly interested in. Uh, finding solutions for so that that's one big piece of one big theme um, within facilities too um, like many other organizations a lot of these corporations are um, putting out sustainability goals they're putting out um, uh, you know challenges to themselves of we are going to be you know carbon neutral or we're going to be xyz by xyz and so um, in the food space you know the obviously there's a lot of talk around sustainability and building sustainable food systems and a part of that isn't again not just on farm not just at the retail level, um, that's also um, at the manufacturing level. And so um, we have a company called EcoPlant that recently came through one of our um, uh, one of our uh, our classes, and I believe they're actually speaking today, and they'll be talking yeah. today here, which is awesome. Um, and a part of the reason that what they're doing is really interesting, and I'm not going to butcher their pitch, but um, they are auto, you know they're automating compressor systems um, in in food man largely in food manufacturing facilities. Um, and from what they've done so far, they can show a real dramatic reduction in energy costs um, into um, existing systems without having to rip something out and having a tremendous amount of capital expenditures um, to put their system in. It's, it's literally a cash flow positive uh, endeavor for the manufacturer from day one. So they, the manufacturing facilities literally make, start making more money from the first day they've implemented the, um, the eco plant system. And so you're starting to see um, we're really interested in companies that are doing things like that that can come in um, you have to have a real immediate roi and if you, you also it's it is hard to drive adoption if you have huge capital expenditures around your system and so if you're a startup out there starting to think about that like how do you get in really cheaply and easily show really quick roi and not have to rip something out because these food like a lot of these food manufacturers have been around for a long time and these facilities are old and um but really expensive and 
uh, they don't want to spend another million dollars to update, you know, a sing- to, to put your thing in on the system. So, um, and I guess like the last thing I'll say, and then uh, we can pass it over, it is tying it back into that labor piece um, and, and the automation process. So in manufacturing, it's not just robotics, it's also things that can make workforces more efficient and effective. So it's efficiency uh, technology for manufacturing, for, for workforce efficiency. Um, it's also employee health and safety. So a lot of these um, environments in food manufacturing are dangerous environments with lots of things like saws and you're literally shoulder to shoulder with people. And so they can be, um, they can be dangerous environments for, for human beings to work in. And that's also part of what's driving um, not having enough people to work in. People don't want to work there. People don't want to work in these environments. Um, and so, um, so employee health and safety, compliance uh, type technology, workforce efficiency type technology and on top of the robotics piece all play into that labor piece, um, that labor element that every single food manufacturing is feeling the crush of right now they just don't have enough people um, to do the jobs that need doing all right that is a entry to you taylor it doesn't get better than that i'd say keep it shorter so we can have a little bit more conversation at the end great job brett sounds good i I will keep it short and sweet but i will do my best to spike the set from brett on that one um the yeah, I, I'm really excited about the group that's come together for this summit um, because there's there's great stuff going on um, for early stage founders looking at this space. Um, I'm going to say something that is probably not news whatsoever to this audience, but manufacturers one to the next are pretty different. Um, startup founders are just starting to figure this out in a lot of ways. It's kind of what Brett was talking about. You have these concentrations of capital and entrepreneurial energy on the coasts. Um, and fortunately, that's proliferating outside um, and even within, you know, a San Francisco or New York or a Boston, more and more understanding of just the complex problems. And I think that's exciting because there has been so much advancement in not just what is bleeding edge AI or machine learning or those sorts of things, but how do we apply it in the day to day is getting so much stronger. Um, and great early stage founders are spending the time to understand the problems and apply that. Because I, you know, I think honestly, for most startup founders, uh, and this is sort of a U.S. focused statement here, um, but like if you say, you know, the, the middle skill gap, they have no idea what you're talking about. Um, whereas, you know, from the manufacturing side and some of what Brett was talking about on the labor side, it's a major issue for the United States um, in sort of being able to you know, drive the labor side of um, manufacturing. So uh, first of all, I think we're in a good spot for sort of momentum forward of bottom up entrepreneurial innovation. Um, one thing that I've really seen in interacting and the company that stands out from our last class in the Workforce Development Accelerator is Increment is um, it's actually something that we say at Techstars a lot, which is quality versus quantity. Um, st- Training, education, and support for uh, your workers rarely works just at scale. It has to start with quality before it can go to any quantity. Um, And so individualized solutions that are not just about the person, but what role they're in and the job they're doing. And so Increment's doing this by being an upskilling platform to support training in the manufacturing floor uh, by looking at errors that are being generated and tying that back to what training needs to be done. Um, this is one of those classics, a lot of pen and paper still driving this. How do we change that? How do we, instead of looking at millions of dollars of loss from inefficiency, say it's really about helping that person be a better contributor to this manufacturing floor. So that's one example where it's like, it goes down to the um, per person level versus, hey, we just need to roll out a bunch of training courses. You know, none of this stuff is rocket science, but really hard to implement and execute and get the data integration layer to inform how you help each person one by one by one do better. Um, the other thing that I'll say is, uh, you know, if you go past, hey, I need this line to be more effective or we're really trying to be more efficient here. And you think about your workforce as, you know, such a critical asset to your business. And you think about social capital and just sort of job mobility. Um, We live in a dynamic environment. I'm sure a lot will be said about the pandemic that we're all living through. But another startup that um, were that was from our last class is Future Fit. And they're they like to describe themselves as the GPS for um, your career. But they actually work with you as the employer so that um, they can help your employees understand, like, do I have um, the ability to invest in some upskilling? What what is my next job going to look like? Hopefully that's for me at this company. But if it's not. Um, and we're transitioning between jobs, how do you actually support employees to do that well? How do we really infuse 
that belief that um, if we treat our employees well, our company will benefit from it long term, um, no matter what the path is for them. So um, they're and they're around at the startup showcase. But I really like that focus in a more and more virtual world, but a more highly connected world. How does social capital creation shift and change? Um, last thought I'll throw out there to just be brief here is. Um, and I, I think that in the technology space, we like to think about, hey, let's build big networks. Networks of people are really powerful. Yes, but I think the very interesting transition is we were living in a world mostly of social networks and Metcalf's law, just like the total in of the network was the way that we valued the thing. And we've moved very much to a world of Reed's law, where it's um, the ability for a network to create subgroups very rapidly. It's the WhatsApps, it's the Slacks of the world. And those patterns are what are going to influence the tools of tomorrow. And I see that as the entrepreneurs are innovating in the manufacturing space. So I'll stop there. Cool, so I'm gonna pick up on themes that both Brett had and Taylor had, and I'll start with legacy. So I work with Stanley Black and Decker and they are a 177 year old company. They have equipment they are still using, um, I don't know how long back it goes, but definitely 1940s. So think about whether those have been sensorized. Think about whether those are even going to be connected in a way that we think about for AI and artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so when you ask someone like me to focus on machine learning, a lot of it is, have we connected those old machines? And so one of the companies that we have in the portfolio you'll hear about today is Slide Tracker. He's great at connecting those legacy machines and enabling those machines to connect, begin to be part of that Industry 4.0 uh, transition. I think another really important theme that I want to also sort of touch on is this notion of, um, of uh, you know, complexity in robotics. Um, complexity is complex tasks, but it's also flexible tasks. If you start thinking about we want to move towards a, a, a time period where the consumer is going to be ordering, you know, now they already order the cars that they want made online, and I, I'll let Martin talk about that. but. But moving that towards everything, you know, moving that towards what we do with footwear, which is one of the companies we're talking to, Hylos is actually looking at how do you actually be able to take infinite SKUs and optimize them for the manufacturing floor based on using digital molds and things like that. Um, other areas really have to do with, you know, making those robots um, more efficient and flexible. And so we have a lot of automation going around that in terms of things like, you know, some of the other companies we're looking at. Um, the other thing that I want to really focus on is as we get more and more towards AI in the manufacturing floor, there aren't enough people. Um, not just like the workers who are doing the manual work, um, and, and we definitely, if we want to be more productive, um, we, we, we need more people on the manufacturing floor, but also we're missing people who are data scientists. They don't find manufacturing sexy. They don't find it a cool area to go work. So now we have, you know, an, you know, we don't have enough people doing some of the analytics. Um, so what are ways that we can do to improve that? And then what are ways that we can take that and move them down market to small, medium enterprises? Because the big companies will be able to hire them, but not the medium guys. And so how do we actually make that happen for companies across the whole board in manufacturing? And, and there's a stat I heard that there are 400 million workers doing manufacturing and they represent largely the benefit for 1% of the population in the world. I don't know if those are quite right given that food tech is part of this, but certainly if we wanna get an impact, the quality of life for 10% of the world, we're not gonna hire 4 billion more workers. Um, and, and what do those jobs look like to Taylor's point? And then how do we actually track them in a way that the automation that we're putting in is flexible and enable us to do things more, more automated. So I'm gonna pause there and, and turn it over to Martin because he's gonna have some cool thoughts, I think, on automation. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think I can, I can start by, by saying that uh, automotive and, and, and OEMs, uh, it's not an industry which uh, has been very startup friendly in the last years, right? I think like uh, with, with uh, the start of Tesla, this uh, changed uh, heavily and what we are observing now and that the mega trends like uh, climate change, demographic change, urbanization, technology change, of course, are driving the transformation of the automotive and mobility industry. And uh, what we see now, uh, the cars are becoming more electrified, autonomous, connected. You mentioned that data is, is key. And uh, what we also think and, and see also from, from players, Stellantis is around the corner here, uh, formerly uh, Fiat, FCA, uh, the cars will be updated yearly. Right. So when we look at the user today, the driver, I'm still driving an old car, a combustion engine, but looking at the younger technically savvy generation uh, is playing a key role in driving this transformation and demanding new business models. Right. So we are using cars different 
will be using them different in the next uh, couple of years. And those users are also forcing uh, the industry to rethink the habits and the value chain, um, how they produce manufacture cars. So for example, 3D printing and or additive, additive manufacturing is used across many stages uh, of, of car manufacturing from prototyping uh, and tooling fabrication to spare end part production, enabling automakers to stay agile and innovative. And I think I don't want to speak about the uh, Corona, but at the operational level, uh, the pandemic has accelerated this development in the automotive industry. And many of these changes are largely positive, right? For example, greater willingness of OEMs uh, to cooperate with uh, partners like innovative startups and uh, thinking like, like um, technology companies like startups means uh, very customer centric. So we had a great example last year in the class. Um, we know it, it's really, really hard to crack um, like sales process, a sales cycle, building credibility and working with uh, large corporates, working with OEMs, um, especially, let's say, the, the tier one OEMs, uh, Porsche, Daimler, BMW, and to, to figure out how to collaborate. But this is changing. This is becoming better. And not only externally, but also I'll speak about it in a second. Uh, those companies are also opening up and changing their behavior, how they uh, produce cars and look at the, the, the customer. So um, the, the reorganization of, of the automotive sector will have far reaching consequences for the entire industry and the, and the value chain, right? And if the incumbents want to remain successful, both uh, manufacturers and suppliers uh, will have to offer like more customer oriented innovations. And uh, one thing to mention is here, they have to be fast, right? All these trends are likely to become increasingly apparent between today or yesterday, rather, with Tesla and looking at this uh, upcoming new uh, car uh, brands and the 2025, 2030. You mentioned that uh, Leila, like uh, Volvo, for example, decided to go fully online with their car sales, right? So they will not sell car anymore via dealerships, but purely online, wow. which is uh, big news uh, now here in, in Europe. Yeah. So this is something which is entirely new. And uh, if you if you look at numbers, uh, right? So five of the top 20 companies within with, with the highest R&D investment are vehicle manufacturers, but they do not feature among the top 10 most innovative companies. There's just one, and you can guess it probably it's Tesla. Yeah, so they just. So how do you test them. drive if you're going to be all on live? How do you test drive? I mean, I want to get in a car. <laughs> Honestly, I want to drive it, especially if I can't yeah, that, afford it. Right. That, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, like uh, looking at the, the market now, it's still a very, very old school, right? So you still go to your dealer, buy it. Uh, I think uh, what I hear it now from, from a different company, I don't want to mention the name, they are thinking in a similar direction. Um, you, you can like get your car delivered to your house, drive it for a few days. People will pick it up again. Then you decide if you buy it okay. or not. All I'm right, not sure if know. Volvo is going to do the same, but uh, I can imagine that uh, you, don't have, you don't have to leave the house actually to, to buy a car. Uh, it's delivered to your house and uh, probably autonomously. And <laughs> or we have a company which is offering teleoperations, so they bring cars uh, to wherever you want to. Right. So there is a teleoperator sitting in Eastern Europe. He's driving the car, bringing it to wherever you need it. Uh, nowadays, for for car sharing mainly, but I could imagine that could be something which OEMs might also be interested in. Yeah, unfortunately, not here today. But uh, if you want to get in touch with them, it's Imperium Drive. They are currently in my program. Um, All right. Oh, yeah. Speaking shall of OEMs. Scott? Let's, shall we move it to Scott and then we'll get into a conversation after that? Sound good? Okay, cool. That's good, yeah. All right, Scott, you're up. Uh, this is great. Thanks for having me. This is, this is super cool. I mean, it, it's it's clear that the resonating themes here that innovation and speed will win in even in these these legacy industries that, that, that we're talking through today. But yeah, I'll, I'll just talk quickly um, about chemical manufacturing. You know, uh, you know, the other thread that everybody mentioned is that, that AI and ML are obviously taking over. And yes, that's that's also happening. It's the most developed from an automation of manufacturing. Obviously, yes. But there's some very interesting things happening in the pre-production side as well on the R&D side. Uh, you know, traditionally uh, in chemical manufacturing, when you have process chemists, uh, yeah. During manufacturing, there's maybe, let's just say, 50 experiments that need to happen. Well, through AI, through machine learning, and some of the innovative ideas that are coming through, instead of 50 experiments, maybe five, maybe two, maybe maybe one even. And that's just increasing speed for everybody. So, uh, you know, 
really on the R&D side is where we're seeing AI be most innovative. Obviously, it's happening from an automation standpoint, um, but it, the early stage discovery is where I see AI being, being most innovative and, and most creative. And then also, um, you know, we're seeing this in chemical manufacturing now, and this is, um, you know, I haven't been around chemical manufacturing over a couple of years, so it, it's not news to me. But I'm always shocked and I'm always scratching my head of this legacy manufacturing process is only now starting to think hyper local when they're thinking about their supply chain. They're only just now starting to think of plant circularity where we're taking waste streams and we're putting back the end of the supply chain. And that's a combination of a bunch of different things that have happened that have created this 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 hyper need. Um, you know, the government intervening and making it tougher for materials and chemicals to transport even between state lines, let alone global lines is happening. Uh, sustainability efforts and measurements that are happening on a global scale, all the way down to the individual company, like Brett talked about, where we're going to hit these goals by this date. The obvious way you're going to look at it is through plant, plant circularity. So that reverse supply chain, the waste uh, supply chain, um, it's those vital resources that folks are putting into their systems and putting into the manufacturing process that are so scarce. And that's where it's getting really interesting for us. And then, and then lastly, I'll touch on, because we're seeing this from a supply chain perspective, is that an, organi an organism could be CapEx. So in chemical manufacturing, could I take an organism, something that I'm fermenting like a beer or a tea, use that in the chemical manufacturing process in some way to create my entire plant just more sustainable. So those are three things that uh, we're starting to see at Heritage Group and at Techstars and a part of our companies. We had some really interesting ones go through last year that I'll get into here in a bit um, that touch on all three of those areas. Outstanding. Lots of great topics to touch on. I, I want to touch on that circularity a little bit, Scott, because none of, we didn't really talk about it, but I see it too. I definitely see it in terms of also dynamic workflows from the supply chain. And you know, where does AI have the easiest amount of value where you have lots of data, right? So we have often lots of data from our supply chain and also our customers, and that's where sometimes the low hanging fruit. Um, and then getting into the factory where you're still trying to get this data from legacy systems, um, you know, that takes a little longer. And so we have some folks, you know, like my, one of my companies, Sensei, is looking at all of those, you know, what do we do and how do we manage that stuff? Um, but let's sort of jump out a bunch of topics and then we'll have to jump in as needed. Automation, like, I don't know, how do we start there? Who wants to start on automation? Brett, you mentioned it, quick, fast or easy. Your favorite company in space. Favorite company in the automation space. Um, uh, a different level of the manufacturing process, but actually in the growing stage, there's a company called IAMIS, which is automating a lot of the work in poultry houses right now. Um, and so using, it's a robotics play that's automating a lot of what has been, it's a really harsh environment, um, high levels of ammonia, a really, really difficult place for people to work. Um, and so they're automating a lot of the stuff that has to go in um, in the growing and, and creation uh, stage of, of one of the major uh, proteins on the planet. So that's a really cool thing. Anyone else who's got something else? All right, Scott. We had a really interesting company go through our program uh, I'll say a couple fascinating things about them. The name of the company is called Synthetics. Um, they developed an electrochemistry reactor, so a physical hard tech reactor, and a piece of software that's machine learning software that does exactly what I talked about, where it speeds up the development and the testing of molecules. Super cool company, two female founders, both from NYU. The really cool thing about them is that this Friday, on Disney Plus, National Geographic did a documentary on them along with a couple other international founders. And to Taylor's point, like the eyeballs are seeing this space in ways they've never seen. Like five years ago, we would we may have said National Geographic was getting involved, but for this documentary to be on Disney Plus this Friday, it's pretty cool. That is totally cool. Really cool. So I'll throw out Modica, one of my companies that's doing cell manufacturing. And that goes on to, I think, can't remember who talked about 3D printing, but definitely 3D printing and other kinds of you know automation, being able to really move that towards uh, factories that are 
you know, maybe it's a container size with lots of different cells where you move things around using a backplane software in terms of making more efficiencies. Um, obviously, some of the areas where you see huge uptake in that is 3D printing. But at the end of the day, what you're seeing automated on the factory floor is is going to be software defined in a lot of ways. And, and then the connections between those different capabilities on the manufacturing floor. Um, Taylor, I know you see stuff too. So talk to me yeah. about what you think. Oh, and I'm, I'm just going to once again approach it from more of the, the human capital, the, yep. the team side, um, where, you know, there's, we're not automating the humans yet, but, uh, you know, the, the, the big headline is that the automation isn't completely replacing all the jobs. Once again, stuff that the audience knows, right? Like it's, you know, I thought there was some really great work that came out of the work of the future task force out of MIT that articulated this well. Robots are great at deep and vertical solutions and to get stuff from point A to point Z across the manufacturing process, us as humans continue to be the best and the only solution at the, at the horizontal um, and connecting all those pieces. But what does that mean for our workers? It means that, you know, and I'll go back to the, um, the two companies I mentioned before, because I think it hits this point exactly, is if the jobs are changing due to automation, not disappearing, but changing, how are you supporting people going through that change? Because if you don't support them, if you don't retrain them, um, and there's really also exciting opportunities for upskilling in this, right? Because a lot of what we're doing is we're moving to higher value input opportunities to the value chain. And hopefully some of that really gets passed through to our workers and creates a more sustainable employment environment, um, it creates longer retention, higher satisfaction from your workers, et cetera. But it requires investment on the front end. Um, it does not happen magically. And so, you know, and I, you know, I'm, I'm confident that the people uh, here with us today know that, but it's how do we use things that take our data, you know, whether it's from very old machinery, like you were talking about Lila or old systems in, you know, coding languages that were popular, popular two or three decades ago and in, interpret that into a modern interface, something where someone's like, I actually know what to do with this. How do I put this to work? So, you know, it's those opportunities that I think are really interesting. In, Taylor, in that, if I might jump ahead, in here quickly, because yeah. I have a company that sounds like exactly the profile you just mentioned, right? So they are actually also exhibiting today Prognostic IO. They create an industry 4.0 uh, risk management platform for physical assets. So they are monitoring machines, old, new ones, uh, try to automate workflows, and have a fantastic AI with a beautiful dashboard, which helps operating, reducing downtimes, reducing waste, and reducing carbon. So uh, sounds like a similar description of what you were just uh, speaking about. Definitely. Media. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll have to take a look at them. I, I haven't seen them from, uh, from, from your program yet. But it, here's the one thing that I think is sort of incredible. It's like somehow we're in 2021 and product design is still an amazing competitive advantage. And like, I, I do love a beautiful interface, but it's like sometimes it's not about the, it's just like the simplicity of understanding how it's going to integrate into the work day of the worker can be so different. And one of my favorite examples of this is um, Palantir. Uh, it's a highly complex system, um, but when they first started and it was being deployed uh, mostly through the U.S. military, like soldiers were writing Congress people, please, please do not let them take this away from us. I, I don't know, I, and I, I engage with the US military a fair amount through a, a nonprofit that I, that I work with called Patriot Bootcamp. They've never described software that way ever before. Um, and like that to me is what product design as a competitive advantage can be. But you only get that by putting like product designers and engineers working directly with the people experiencing the problem. We, there's, a, um, uh, on, like, there's a portfolio company that we have called Heavy Connect, which is, um, they do a lot of like food safety compliance. Um, it's a food safety compliance software, and it's largely being used by harvesting crews on fields. And um, you know, and they literally have they have a huge, a fairly large engineering team. Every single engineer spends two weeks in farms with harvesting crews every year. Um, the the CEO of the their magic why they're better than everybody is the the interface. I was in I was walking through broccoli fields with the harvesting crews in Salinas, California, right before the pandemic, and the guy, like this, this guy that led this crew was so proud to show me the Heavy Connect app and how he used it. And it's because Patrick lived in the field with this guy for two years prior to building it. Uh, and because they have a dedication to sending the entire team into the field um, with the actual end user every year um, and are very committed to it. 
And I think that's really key, right? This notion of collaborative robots and everything, at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of workers who look at the robots with good reason, with fear, right? I mean, there are a lot of pretty nasty injuries that happen on the on the factory floor. And so we have a company called Pure Robotics. And what's really cool about them is you walk up to them and with touch, you know, this is like one of the robots that can actually move things around on a warehouse. With touch, a worker can just push it and teach it where it needs to go. It doesn't need to have this interface where you're, in, you know, you're dealing with all sorts of other ways. It's actually as if you were taking a child by your hand and telling them, okay, we're gonna go across the street now. Nope, stop now, don't go now. I mean, it's the way we interact with each other. And so when we get to the stage of you know workers being able to have productivity, that UI is so important. It's it, I really can't. I mean, I reinforce exactly what you say, Taylor. And Martin, you look like oh, Scott, go for it. Let's let's keep pulling on that thread just for, for yeah. one more second, Lila. Um, you know, and in, in I'll, I'll keep going back to chemical manufacturing. The the systems that they're continually using are so old and from a supply chain management perspective, they're just ancient. And the likelihood of Monument Chemical, I'll just I'll use them as an example. I, I don't know this for a fact, but they're a company I work with directly. The likelihood of them throwing out their legacy system tomorrow because there's an entrepreneur that started a new platform, slim. It's just not gonna happen. Yeah. But we are starting to see, and I really wanna find a company for our program this year, that a company that's building AI ML systems that sit on top of these legacy old ERP systems. Yeah. When you think about Salesforce, Salesforce is a little bit clunky, but there are thousands of applications and solutions that sit on top of Salesforce that make it better. And that's, we're just starting to see that in the manufacturing world too. So I've got two companies today who are going to be presenting. One's called Adoro, who is doing exactly that concept, which is that you've got these old legacy systems. You may have an MMS or MES system, which is kind of that organizing system, but you can't get the value out of it because you're not connected to different parts of manufacturing. So these guys are saying, look, you know, you need just these little apps that will connect you into um, materials handling or into tool management. So for the smaller market where you can't really afford a lot of that huge IT infrastructure and all this, you know, the warm bodies that understand data, these guys are trying to make, you know, value on top of that, kind of like Salesforce. You're adding a little bit of functionality that you just add on top. Um, I, I think that's that's really a way where we're going to see a lot of the smaller companies affording how to really get value out of that automation. And Brett, you look like you really want to say something. So, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to put, push one more company. The other company is called iFlow, and that's actually on the high end, right? So if you've got all these systems that are connected now, how do you keep them connected, right? Let's say you have all this software on top of all this stuff. You now have a software upgrade, right? And something breaks. The, you know, you don't know where it broke. How do you figure out where the data broke, right? And that's what these guys are doing. So it goes back, Scott, to your idea of like, how do you connect this? And then how do you make it usable for someone in the factory to fix it? So, okay, I've totally like pushed my company. So let's find an interesting another topic, uh, sustainability. Um, I can jump in uh, uh, yeah. on a couple here. Uh, one interesting uh, trend in the food space that like, people have you've probably heard a lot of is upcycling. And so it's a, at the back end of a manufacturing process, there are outputs that are um, not used for whatever the end product intended end product was. There's a company that we have called Renewal Mill, um, which the, the byproduct of the, of the soy manufacturing product uh, process is called Okara. They take Okara, they upcycle it uh, into a flour. Um, and, you know, the hard parts here are um, how do you think about plugging into an existing line, existing system? Um, make, or do you, are you taking in the food space? It's heavy, right? Like one of the hard parts about food is that even the byproducts there, if you want to move them somewhere else to a new facility, it's heavy. It's uh, it's also perishable. Um, and so you have, there's a lot of complexities. So the upcycling piece is a really interesting trend in food right now. Um, and you see a variety of use cases from like spent grains at beer to um, things like what Renewal Mill is doing um, into oftentimes the product end product is actually better it has value props beyond the thing the ingredient that it is um it is replacing so that's a definitely a one outside of a couple of others i mentioned earlier that a trend that we see in the food manufacturing space is making sure that we're using all the waste streams do you see companies that are actually doing something with food waste you know just reprocessing it reusing it elsewhere i mean because that's certainly something that people are talking about in the circular economy right yeah i mean there's like uh, uh scott mentioned fermentation earlier um the friend fermenting there's a 
there are a tremendous number of startups out there that are taking food waste and trying to turn it into a variety of things. Um, probably the most frequent use case is animal feed. Um, so to, uh, taking food waste and turning uh, turning it into animal feed um, at the end, at, you know, end product. And and, um, and there's there could be some interesting things there. I think that oftentimes they um, forget that those startups often forget that they then they can sure they can make an animal feed, but then they have to go sell it. So they they're really good at like the how do we take these food waste products and um, turn it into an animal feed product. The, the, one of the other real challenges is consistency. So um, mm -hmm. big uh, big buyers of anything that come out of like food waste upcycling, um, you have to have a really consistent product, and it has to be the makeup of that product has to be the same over time. And when you're dealing with food waste, um, so let's say you're taking stuff from like cafeterias or large restaurant chains or um, big food service, it's it tends not to be a consistent um, input. And if you don't have consistent inputs, you don't have consistent outputs. And so it's a real challenge um, in the food upcycling space, um, which is uh, why the companies that are having some success and getting some traction are focused on a single thing, like you know, soy manufacturing process. And even in that case, um, the, end, the end results can vary slightly. Um, um, and when you're talking about like a very highly regulated industry like food, um, you often have bands that you have to um, live within uh, for a variety of different reasons. And so um, the consistency piece of food upcycling is really difficult to deal with um, in many cases. But I think it is doable and, and you're seeing, so, I mean, we had a company that was, we looked at a company that was doing um, upcycling and turning it into a cleaning product. Um, so one of the, um, the outputs is actually, and as a cleaning product, um, the water output um, was a cleaning product. So there's a lot of different ways people are thinking about it. Anything else? Sustainability? There's lots of topics here. So, Martin? Yeah, I think especially, um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Especially automotive and, and sustainability didn't fit well in the, in the last 20 years, right? Now with the EV cars, it's, it's changing. And I've seen really interesting companies um, working on vegetarian leather, interior, exterior, exterior as well, uh, building new type of products, uh, new type of uh, materials uh, for cars. Which is very interesting and of course like uh, big manufacturers announced a couple of weeks ago uh, yesterday that uh, they are stopping um, building combustion engines and they're fully focusing on the v cars right so volvo porsche even announced a sports car uh, not building combustion cars anymore so there's a big trend uh, becoming more sustainable and more climate friendly and i think there are many many opportunities for companies uh, in the upcoming years for, for startups to innovate uh, the entire car experience. Is there one that you like? Like, can you point to like one thing that you think would be really cool to see? Yeah, I like the car, which is uh, the, the, the company that is producing vegetarian leather. Yeah? So I, I had this in my hands, actually, and it feels like real leather, but it's vegetarian. Wow. So they make it out of yeah. like what, what kind of like plant based? I think it, it's made from from apples, if I'm not wrong. Apples and some mixed uh, stuff. <laughs> it's pretty cool. But is you, that, you don't see the difference. Is that company right? Geltex, Martin? No, no. Oh, okay, okay. Now, I know another company that's trying to that's doing the same thing, but they're doing it for fabric wall coverings. Oh, cool. Yeah, I've seen several companies doing that for bags, etc. But this feels amazing, right? And you have the special letter which is different in, in cars. So you have uh, like temperature differences if you put on your your uh, seat uh, uh, AC and stuff. So it's uh, it's very robust and uh, really durable. And if you get Currently hungry, talking you can with eat someone it. else. <laughs> <laughs> you can eat it, yeah, probably. <laughs> if you're we caught in Minnesota in one of those storms and you got to eat, right? <laughs> yeah. We had a company go through. We had a company go through there. It touches on both Martin and Brett. So we had a company go through. It's called Mobile Fluid Recovery, and they actually do just what they sound. What it sounds like: mobile fluid recovery of swarf and oil and sledge, and they specialize in auto manufacturing. And I found they're based in Texas, but they, they have an operation up here in Indiana where the Subaru plant, when they get done with a car before it hits the trailer and goes to the dealership, they wipe it down with basically like a, a, a cleaning, an antibacterial cloth, but it's massive. It's a huge antibacterial cloth. And when they were done with that, they just trash it and pull a new one off the shelf. Well, this gentleman in mobile fluid recovery will take that used cloth and separate the moisture from it and clean the cloth, put the moisture back into the process so they can take a, that same cloth, dip it again, and then clean the car again. Um, it's just fascinating the way that that's happening. And he's doing that in oil cleanup, swarf recycling, sludge removal. So it's an interesting touch on that. It's happening in auto, but
but it's happening at the localized level rather than the global level right now. The, the thing I'd throw in there, I, you know, I'm not the expert on the sustainability side like uh, the rest of the, the rest of you. So it's really exciting to learn from you on what, what you're seeing here. But I have been trying to become smarter on just the broader ESG space because I think we're at this critical moment, especially for larger corporate partners. Um, like sustainability, not new. Climate crisis, very real. We need to take more action as quickly as possible. But the data is finally coming. And so now there is an emerging data set that shows that like in investing in sustainability or even broader ESG is not uniform. Like you don't get material returns on capital for all forms of ESG. But now we're starting to see that if you do it in this industry this way, you get a return on capital and you drive shareholder value. Most of the data is public company, big company stuff. And I think that's what's exciting is in partnership with big corporations saying, hey, I've got some data so I can make a business case and invest against this. And then we as tech stars and the startups that we all work with can say, let's pull that down because public companies are great. But how do we apply that same thought to where is innovation actually driving value? Because it's not just, hey, just do sustainability, do ESG. It's what are the spots where we can create unique solutions that create value long term? So I, I think we're at this like tipping point moment that will hopefully change what happens in the next five years. One of the um, and just to tag on to that, Taylor, the, uh, one of the cool things that I think large corporate that is driving that even faster is large corporations that have made um, commitments to carbon neutrality, um, how they're doing it in the short run is they're they're buying carbon credits. Right. And. So and the really interesting part about that and the, the why that's good for startups, especially startups that are focused on sustainability, um, uh, it, not not even just like the ability to sell their carbon credits. Right. It's not even that uh, what it's doing is it's actually putting a price tag, a dollar value on the mitigation of carbon. And so now a big corporation can say, hey, we go work with an eco plant and reduce our carbon footprint by this much. It's it's not just the reduction in energy costs. They're also able to assign if we had to do that through a carbon market and buy that in mass, it would cost us X number of dollars. And so it actually takes that ROI and puts a real dollar value around carbon neutrality. It's a real, cause it is a real cost now with so many companies joining different paths and making um, commitments. It, it's a real actual cost. And so it allows to tell a much broader ROI story around carbon neutrality and carbon reduction, which is really interesting to me. And I think those are really great opportunities for startups, you know, not even ones that we're touting today, but just in the future. So Stanley Black & Decker, who I work with, has two very aggressive goals in sustainability. One is that by 2025, they want to be out of, out of uh, uh, plastic packaging. And by 2030, they want to be net carbon neutral. I mean, they have 120 factories, some of them with these really old, you know, lays and other things we talked about. And it's not just going to be about, you know, buying carbon, uh, you know, credits. They're really looking at how can we innovate. And this is where I think startups have an opportunity to do some really cool stuff, you know, you know, really make those tiny little improvements like Scott and what Mark were talking about and move those into, you know, kind of the mainstream because the companies are looking for solutions, right? The plastic space is crazy interesting too. Right? Ah. We talk about sustainability and manufacturing right now, um, and in, in the food world, it's like you know a huge deal for us because all food is like is packaged in plastic, and and it's a really hard, again a really hard challenge because you know if you let anything get into food, it's more likely to contaminate, spoil faster, um, and so it which has driven a, a tremendous amount of innovation around what other things can you put on food to. Um, you know, mitigate uh, faster spoilage or extend shelf life if you're not going to be using traditional plastics. Do you, how do you like deal with the food safety issues if you're not using if you're using something porous? Because all the alternative materials that people are using to create um, alternative plastics are por more porous than plastic is. And so, and in food, like that's a terrible, terrible idea when you're talking about shelf stability. And it, but it's really cool to see some of the startups that are like using all different kinds of byproducts of food manufacturing. Like um, there's a really cool company out of Tel Aviv. Um, that's using um, uh, sugarcane husks. So after sugarcane mm -hmm. is processed to create um, uh, alternative packaging material that actually can be heated up to something like 200 degrees Celsius, um, it's something cr you know like really really crazy levels, um, and it's food safe, food grade safe. Um, and so you're seeing a lot of innovation around um, uh, you know around this space. Like how do we make things that are food food grade, food safe um, to store, and will also maintain that shelf life and like. You know, there's a company that was using an extract from silk of spider webs um, yeah. to spray on uh, proteins, and that, uh, and by spraying on proteins, it's food safe. Um, 
it's a low enough level of, um, and you don't even have to include it on packaging on ingredient labels. Um, and it creates a coating that will extend shelf lives for a significant amount of time, which reduces food waste, but also can potentially allow you to adopt a different type of packaging that might be a bit more porous. And it, like, it literally integrates in line of spray, spray and wash machines already. And so there's a lot of just really interesting stuff happening in, in, in the food space around packaging. Sorry for jumping in there. No, that's that great. I think those are really cool things. Scott, you're going to say something. You look like you're like halfway through a sentence now. Nothing? Really? I thought those were so cool. Yeah, aren't they? So that so that's like a pause. We can't we can't top that, Brett. So I know. So we can't change the topic. All right, new topic. Um, let's see what are we what have we talked about? Um, let's go back to workforce, Taylor. I know you have a bunch of stuff that you you've been working on. Do you have anything you want to add to the conversation or shift it in a way that maybe reskilling is something we should talk about? Uh, sure, I can talk about reskilling. The other, the other thing that came to mind was um, just thinking about uh, DEI as well. Um, you know, it's, you know, we're I think really embracing this global moment uh, around uh, creating inclusive workforces, equity in the workplace, um, and I think that very much connects with reskilling because I think part of the the path forward is how are we. Um, creating opportunities, and this is you know true here in the United States, where the majority of this panel is from. But I think obviously it also extends internationally. Of just there's so much opportunity to create an inclusive economy. So the question is, how are we doing that? And thinking about it through the employee life cycle, and that's what I really like about you know um, if you approach reskilling not as just a single jump, but a lifelong journey of a worker. So it's how are we finding people that are moving into the jobs um, that we are offering to the market? And we have a great company that's working on this um, called Mentor Spaces. And here in the US market, they're the mentoring platform to support Black and Latinx communities of young professionals getting into their, their first major um, professional opportunity. Uh, and it's this great thing where they're going to companies and they're saying, hey, can you have because uh, you have a bunch of goals for the diversity of your workforce and ensuring that that diversity is not only you know social value, but also that diversity, there's lots of great business cases, demonstrates, makes your working team better. Um, but have your workforce be mentors to people not yet at your company. And you know what? They might not even um, get all the people that they mentor to come to your company, but we're going to create this interaction so that we're helping the, the next generation. And from that, your employees are going to latch on and say, hey, we've got a new job open and I've been mentoring these five or six people. We got to pull these two people in. And that is such a stronger solution than, hey, we're trying to you know, drive a more diverse workforce or one that's ready to upskill. And we're just going to bunch, put a bunch of people at the top of the pipeline and hope they filter through. So to me, the exciting part about this in terms of workforce development is a more human interaction and social capital development perspective on this because that's what pulls people in. And then we can continue to invest in them over time. So, you know, that's that's some of the, the stuff that I've really seen. I think, I think just to take that to a theme that I've been thinking about is a lot about access to information. You know, the manufacturing industry in general has been really um, tight as a, as a community. You, it's really hard for them to get comfortable sharing information about where they need innovation. It's comfortable, hard for them to talk about, you know, where the glitches are on their manufacturing floor. And I started a speaker series last year with uh, um, Mark Baby, the CTO of Stanley Black and & Decker and Sudi Bangalore, who does the Industry 4.0. And the goal there was really to say, here's a whole bunch of opportunities in manufacturing. We want innovation here. Like, And by the way, this is the size of the opportunity. So go figure out what you want to do in that space. And so maybe all of us should actually do that with our various corporate sponsors and really start talking and giving the community, the entrepreneurs, and anyone kind of in the community, here are the opportunities. This is what we're looking for. We would love to see innovation in these spaces, and and let's you know let's be you know engaging with with uh, helping both entrepreneurs and anyone who wants to be involved with you know beginning to get careers in manufacturing and other opportunities. Because I think information, the context of information, is what's one of the missing pieces here, from my perspective. Yeah. I saw nods. Does that mean yes? Can yeah. I tap you guys all to do like a speaker series with me? Awesome. You're, you're in. <laughs> you can step back fast enough. <laughs> all right. Other topics. We've got about, you know, we've got about six minutes. So we'll do one other brief topic and then I'm going to have closing remarks. And each one of you is going to come up with some really insightful piece of comments or insights. So keep thinking about that thought. And 
Uh, what else do we want to cover? What have we not covered yet? All right, you're all not looking at me, so obviously <laughs> you don't want to answer that. Um, what, okay, so then we'll do closing comments. Easy. Uh, what do you guys think are some of the cool areas you want to see innovation um, in your accelerator next year? Whatever your next program is, what, do, what would you like to see out of manufacturing? Because all of you guys do a handful of manufacturing deals. Where would you like to see that? Scott, I think you kind of answered it so you can reinforce it. You're kind of you're able to get out of the hook there if you want to just build on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me let me actually let me let me have I have, I have a different closing thought. OK. All right. Go for it. You mentioned earlier, and, and we try to stay away from talking about the pandemic, um, but I'll just call it uncertainty, like uncertainty that we have right now, whether it's pandemic, hurricane, snowstorm, big market changes are affecting the supply industry. They're affecting everybody in terrible ways, but they're also uh, affecting the supply side and they keep continually getting squeezed. So I often hear in talking to founders, that are maybe academic, scientific, chemist founders, that uncertainty leads them to think about maybe pausing or waiting in some capacity. And that nothing gets me more twitchy than hearing that potentially. I actually, you need to figure out a way if you're an entrepreneur in this space and in the in these industries that you can find it, you can, you can learn quickly in a very safe environment. You need to find friendly people, friendly advisors that can help you plan, test, proof, iterate with you. Um, and and I've found, and keep in mind, I've only been doing this for 14 months now, but process chemists are fast. They're entrepreneurs at heart. And that's my fastest way in. And I've found a lot of success in just riffing with process chemists about how to do things better. So I'll leave folks with that. Has that been, from a commercial standpoint, the fastest way in uh, for a lot of our founders from this last class to get in and start thinking about how they can be commercially effective? All right. Next. I can jump or I can jump in. Um, I think I've probably mentioned that several areas of interest in the manufacturing space. Throughout. I'll give one that I haven't mentioned yet, which is um, uh, there's an opportunity for manufa like uh, geo dispersed manufacturing, right? So localized manufacturing in the food space as well. And so I think that that probably is like 3D printing of food is um, one way to think about it. Um, I think there's some really interesting opportunities. There's a whole industry around co-packing or co-manufacturing for food companies so a lot of the big brands you you all know like the company that like m that the, whose name is on the box might not actually make that thing and so um i think there's a real interesting opportunity for um geo-based uh, manufacturing of food um largely probably through smaller footprints with uh like 3d printing and so i think that's kind of interesting and a new one then one quick final thought um just like you, you hear this panel today and it's so in, I, like, if you're an entrepreneur thinking about like a space to innovate in, right? Um, think of how much manufacturing affects everybody's life, right? For, and you don't think about the manufacturing space. It's such an unsexy space. Um, but like, without food manufacturing, you don't have food. Like, you know, you don't have cars to drive. You don't have, you know, you can't do these things that we take for granted every day. And so it's actually a really interesting and important space. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity for innovators in it. Taylor, Martin. Great, I'll jump in. Uh, here's my closing thought um, as it relates to the, the workforce that is you know, a central part of the businesses that um, you know, are run by manufacturers. The argument usually goes turnover and training is really expensive. And sometimes people even go to that it's you know, 2x their salary or you know, whatever in different spaces, different jobs have different numbers. And that's really tough, but I would say I, I would challenge everyone with the following thought. Don't stop there. Um, say, hey, if we've quantified how costly turnover is for us, um, consider being the champion to say we're going to run three or four hypotheses. We're going to choose an internal team to think about all the stuff that we know that could change that. And we're going to choose one or two outside startups or innovative solutions to try to use as the counterbalancing hypothesis to say, can we de deliver a solution that changes turnover at a different cost structure than what we just finished saying on how expensive turnover is? Because that's a lot of what I see is we stop at the turnover is expensive. But let's go to that next stage and say, let's run some hypotheses because there's so many good solutions out there. So that's my thought to end on for today. Martin? 
I can just tell you what I would love to invest in because I'm a big fan of EV cars. And uh, one thing, uh, one reason why I haven't bought one is uh, the battery life, right? So the range of, of EV cars. And I looked at two companies last year and one company this year. And I think I have found one company from next year already, which is producing a new kind of batteries, which will allow us to travel two or 3,000 kilometers, which is like 1,500 miles plus with one uh, charging. So uh, it's a new type of, of manufacturing. It's a new type of, of components they are putting together. A very R&D driven project yet, but uh, I hope that it will be ready to market. And I hope that also these uh, large OEMs will open up and uh, give those startups a chance to uh, integrate their products. Great. So I am going to just add to that silos. I want to get rid of silos. I think we have dynamic workflows going all the way back into our supply chain. I have one company called EMS Forest, which really looks at how do you create quality back into all of your various con uh, contract manufacturing going multiple ways. I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to see being able to have better collaborative capabilities. And that extends also towards product design, going back, Scott, to your comments on computational chemistry and you know, the materials and then designing them, designing them for manufacturability all the way out to the customer and how do you deliver customer and service and all that. I think those flows are, um, are going to do better and better. And, and for manufacturing, it's really critical to improve on those. So that's, I'd love to see, see uh, opportunities there. And with that, we are on the hour and I'm going to, first of all, thank everyone here. Thank you for all your time, your comments. Um, really, really appreciate it. We didn't have time for questions. So, for those uh, corporate companies in the in the um, uh, in the audience, in about 15 minutes, we're going to do breakout sessions. All these guys have been tackled to to be in two two of the roundtables. Please come and join us and ask questions and have a conversation. Um, it's not open to the startups in the audience. I apologize, but I will do a pitch that you know, starting around 12:15, we will have the next set of panels. And around one or so, we're going to have the startup uh, showcase where those startups will be able to talk, or some of the startups will be able to talk about what they're doing. And, and all of us have some companies, so we're going to be presenting there. So please come and join us for that. Um, and don't forget to go back to the website both during and after to network because there's an opportunity to really interact with folks who are all trying to do all the topics and the areas of improvement we just talked about. So thanks, everyone, and look forward to seeing you in other panels. Take care.